Jazz lover and scientist Tom Blundell has a deep appreciation of nature and a unique ability to decipher patterns locked within it. His early work on insulin with Dorothy Hodgkin's team revealed for the first time the physical structure of a protein, something that had eluded scientists for decades. Seeing what proteins actually look like has been the catalyst for the rest of Tom's numerous discoveries. Well, I think Tom's a pretty exceptional scientist, actually. He's, he's clearly a scientific polymath. I think that ability to think laterally has really been terribly significant in his career because it's enabled him to sort of move from structure to function um, to, in the end, looking at a protein and um, surmising how one might design a drug to interact with it. Tom has always been a creative person. My grandfather was a, an artist and also a musician. So my life uh, when I was young was being taken doing either crowns or watercolours at the weekend and uh, picking up musical instruments around the house because my mother thought it was a bad idea to have people talk, they should be encouraged. So um, I became a jazz musician because I couldn't read music properly <laughs> and um, at school I thought I was going to go into the arts but the uh, headmaster was pretty helpful, he said, you know, you might be better at the sciences. So, so you were aimed <laughs> towards science. At Oxford University, Tom joined the lab of Dorothy Hodgkin, who won the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work in X-ray crystallography. The lab team were working on insulin crystals, which were easily available because they were being mass-produced for the treatment of diabetes. Tom came to Dorothy Hodgkin's lab after it had been working on the structure of insulin for probably nearly 30 years, and yet within a relatively short space of time, um, they were publishing the seminal papers in Nature which described the structure of zinc insulin from X-ray crystallographic data. By bombarding X-rays at a protein crystal and looking at the way in which those X-rays interact and are deflected by the atomic structures in the protein, you essentially get um, a pattern um, which in the early days was actually captured on a photographic plate and the clever bit is being able to interpret that pattern and understand what it's telling you about molecular structure. You get thousands of spots all over a, a, a film in those days. By viewing the x-ray scattering the team revealed the structure of insulin. The first time anyone had seen the shape of such a complex protein hormone. When we finally had the structure of insulin and I realised how beautiful it was. It was that beauty and complexity and it brought me back to my artistic uh, aspirations and yeah. said, you know, you can find it here. While Dorothy had been working on the structure of insulin, Fred Sanger had mapped its amino acid sequence. Bringing these two approaches together allowed Tom to see how amino acid sequences fold to form shapes. But how about the other way around? Could Tom reverse engineer insulin structure and work out the amino acid sequences that could produce it? He predicted that very different sequences would produce similar structures. Tom found that some of his theoretical sequences were close matches to actual proteins, but although physically alike, they had very different functions. And that was another fantastic moment when I realised that there were all kinds of exploration of evolution, finding other relatives of insulin, which it turned out did quite different things, like uh, dilate the birth canal before... Yes, uh, and, and of course that's really crucial because our understanding today that families of proteins exist that have structural similarities but may nonetheless do very different jobs is way in advance of where it was when you were working on insulin in the 60s and 70s. This work had exciting therapeutic implications, which Tom uncovered when he went on to study the HIV genome. We had a fantastic simple genome. We had about eight or nine gene products. Uh, we found another one, which was a proteinase that we predicted its structure and then saw analogies 
which allowed us to design molecules to inhibit it. Tom noticed that the HIV proteinase structure had a section in common with human enzymes involved in the regulation of blood pressure. He suggested that an antihypertensive drug could be modified to create a new antiviral to treat HIV. And with that knowledge, going from gene to protein to drug, one realised, certainly we all realised, that if we had the whole of a pathogen genome, a larger genome, or the human genome, we could use that information uh, to develop new medicines in a much more rational way. You have a structure, you can visualise a space in that structure that the target drug might sit in and interact with, yeah. and you then need to design the chemical that will do Well, that. you get a very tiny fragment. You can see where the fragment is experimentally, and then you discuss with the chemist how you grow the molecule, and as it grows, the affinity gets higher. Actually, it's very visual. I mean, you see, you see a structure, you see a potential binding site, you see a small molecule in there that sort of fits but isn't going to do very much. Um, do, do you think that side of it actually appeals to you? That's very much not only appeals to me, but I think it's important. You know, I had a big battle with a referee last year. I wrote in this paper uh, that there was a kind of analogy between my molecular architecture and townscapes. The referee said, this is not scientific. I never want to hear anything like this in a scientific paper. And I wrote back and said, it's absolutely the core of science. By seeing uh, analogies, by lateral thinking, that's how new ideas come. They don't come from a linear process. Biophysics is the application of physical techniques. X-ray crystallography is a physical technique um, for examining structures to biological specimens. Um, so um, in its simplest term, it's that. To, to, to an ordinary biologist like me, Biophysics is jolly difficult science. I just love having a lab which has, you know, mathematicians, engineers, physicists, I've got nuclear physicists even, uh, chemists, biologists and even medics all together. But having this multidisciplinary group where everyone knows that they have something to learn from the person next to them, that's what really makes it wonderful and very much more stimulating. And you're always learning something. You always know you don't know enough. <laughs> I think Tom's success um, in everything he does, be it um, science, um, politics, music, um, derives from application. And I think the only way he does this, as far as I can work out, is by scarcely sleeping. Um, because it's clear he starts his day at some impossible hour of the morning. Um, and I happen to know he clearly usually works until impossibly late hours of the night as well. What do you think about the advances that our subject has made over the last hundred years? Well, I find it quite remarkable what courage and foresight some of these people had. You know, Dorothy Hodgkin and J.D. Bernal wrote a paper in 1934 when they saw the first diffraction and they said, this is the way we're going to know the structures, the architectures of all the proteins in the universe yes. and, and, and that uh, was a good bit of the last centenary.